episode of The Claude's Corner. Today's guest is an actor and producer. His television credits include Kojak, The White Shadow, Hill Street Blues, MacGyver, In the Heat of the Night, Simon and Simon, Equalizer, NYPD Blue, Martial Law, ER, Law and Order, and that's just to name a few. His film credits include Brew Baker, A Soldier Story, Quicksilver, and Purple Hearts. He is most well known for playing Cochise in the 1979 iconic film, The Warriors. So without further ado, please welcome the extremely talented David D. Harris to the Claws Corner. David, how are you? Hi, I see you. Uh, I'm doing well. I can't see you because this block says, it says, get out. I don't know what this is, uh, but meeting is being recorded by the host. And this is all this stuff here, so I can't really see you anymore. I don't um, know what that. I'm not sure because I know you and I have been having so many issues trying to get this started, but I can see you perfectly. And when it's recorded, you're going to be able to see, my fans are going to be able to see everything. So if it's not bothering you. It's um, not bothering me. It's just that I, you know, I can't really see you. It's blocking out your face. It just says, this meeting is being recorded by the host and participant. The account only also blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Permission one, record two, uh, two, invite the uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, then it says leave meeting or uh, got it. Should I say got it? Maybe that'll right. go away. Yeah, try got it. I mean, what's the worst? There we go. Happen? There All we right. go. It was probably better if you didn't have to see my face, but. <laughs> oh, I like seeing your face there, Rick, <laughs> buddy. I don't want to read a bunch of, you know, tag stuff. But here we go. We're ready. We're good. We are ready to go. Let's get this thing started. So as I mentioned in the intro, you must have the best agent in the business. You have done so. That was just a very, very short list of all the things that you have done. And I'm going to get into some of my highlights, some of my favorites growing up and watching some of these shows. But before we do that, the first time I ever, I met you twice. The first time I ever met you was the 35th anniversary Coney Island, it was a Warriors reunion. A lot of people were there, and it was great because Warriors is one of my all-time favorite movies. I got a chance to hang out with all the actors that were there, watch the movie with them. It was such a fun night. John Joseph from the Crow Mags was there. Sick of it all, the band was there. It was a fun time by all, and I'm, that was the first time I met you. And then again, I met you at Chiller Convention, which is New Jersey, and that's where they had, I met several of the people I couldn't make, like Deborah Van Valkenburg, I met her there, I met James Ramar. So yes. over the years, I got a chance to meet pretty much everybody that's still around and people still like to do conventions. But I got to say, you were definitely one of the friendliest, one of the nicest, and I appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here for you, Rick. Uh, thank you. So let's go all the way back to when it all began for you acting anyway. 1976. All right, let's go back to the day. <laughs> 1976. Almost like it was yesterday. <laughs> Your first role was as Haywood Pater Patterson in the TV movie Judge Horton and the Scottsboro Boys. Yes. Yes. First time on film. Well, wow. Now, was that a TV movie or was it a made for theater movie? It, it, it was a made for TV movie, as you know, true story, true story. Uh, uh, we were nominated for an Emmy. Uh, the director was nominated for an Emmy. Uh, it was an amazing uh, made-for-TV movie. Worked with some wonderful actors. Worked for a great director, Field of Cook, who directed it. Uh, it was for NBC uh, Television. And uh, we had a great time. We shot in Alabama uh, where it happened. And uh, it was terrific. My first time out of the gate, uh, working with a bunch of really wonderful, young, talented uh, actors. And we were, you know, we were we were guided by an amazing director, Field of Cook, uh, true story, and uh, just had a great time telling the story about what happened to these nine young kids that were falsely accused of raping these two white women. It never ever happened. And as the years passed by before these women died, they confessed that they were never raped by these nine black kids. They were never raped, but they were railroaded. Do you know what I mean? They just were, they were told what to do, these women. And the state of Alabama wanted to lynch these nine young black kids, you know, for, you know, raping. This happened in the thirties where they were lynching black men and black boys by the dozens. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and basically nobody cared. But we had groups from the North 
uh, the Jewish Defense League and uh, lawyers, the lawyers for the nine uh, uh, Scottsboro boys that represented them in court and made a defense for them to try to prove they're innocent. So we had the uh, the NACP uh, and we had a lot of uh, organizations that, that were trying to defend these young kids, but it was a tragic time. The country was in a very tragic state of segregation and, 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 and all this just horrendous stuff that was happening, especially in all the Southern states. And unfortunately, a lot of this stuff still exists today. We see it as jury ma uh, mandering and, and, yeah. and all kinds of trying to suppress the vote and keeping people of color, making it very difficult for people of color, uh, women, uh, uh, gay people, uh, you know, uh, to vote, uh, elderly people to vote. Uh, and it's sad. You know yeah. the state of where the country still exists. You know, and 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 God willing, we you know the country will get up and correct this one day. I hope so. So, in that particular case, they were acquitted. I'm hoping. Is that how? Uh, well, no. It took it took a bunch. It was trial after trial. But uh, the, the the character I played, Haywood Patterson, which was the most out out uh, the one that was very vocal about it. He finally was uh, released from prison, I believe, in 1961 or something. And he died a very tragic life. Most of those Scottsboro boys died a very tragic life. Yeah. You know, with drugs and alcohol. And they were incarcerated for prison for a long time before they finally got released. You know, but it was very traumatic. Well, by then... They're no, in the eye of the people, they're going to always be guilty, even though they were proven not guilty because, and then also, how are they ever, ever going to have a normal life? So I can't imagine. And they didn't. Yeah. And exactly. they didn't have any kind of a normal life because of that stigma that yeah. followed them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And that's sad. Well, that's a pretty good start for your career. The, they get a role that strong and that powerful. So did you always want to be an actor growing up? You know, Rick, uh, you know, I, I, I was a, a silly guy in high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was in high school. I was always jo the jokester. Yeah. I was always making jokes and making people laugh and blah, 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 blah. So I had an English teacher in high school saying, you know what? We, we got to find a path for you, for you to go with your life. What do you really want to do? I mean, you don't want to be a professor of uh you know, history of Europe or Africa or Asia, you're not going to go that way. So what do you think you want to do? You know, you're a funny guy. You make people laugh. You know, maybe you ought to try in uh, drama. And I said, what are you talking about drama? He goes, why don't you just go down to the drama department and just hang out there, look up, look at what's going on, see what you think, and just be a part of that for a while. And I did. And I went down there and I, I, I said, you know, this is interesting. You know, I said, let me, let me uh, try a scene with this acting teacher in the drama department. And I did, and I fell in love with it. I said, you know what? I think this is my, my niche. I think this is what I want to be. I think I want to be an actor. And that's where it started, in high school. Well, you actually went to the high school of performing arts, which was the inspiration for the movie Fame. Yes. So you had a pretty good... Um, introduction to the arts being in a school like that where they reinforced the importance of it and reinforced the part. I, mean, I bet you most guidance counselors in other schools would be like, eh, you know what, you want something more stable, you want something that's going to be make more money. And so I'm glad that you had that reinforcement from the teachers and the other people in school saying that you're, this is what you're good at, follow your dream. And I'm so glad that you did because you've played in so many great TV shows and movies and you, you have so many fans. So um, you made the right decision. Thank you. You always said that the best way to get your start is to go to New York City and star in plays. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, New York City is the mecca of, of the arts. Uh, if you wanna be a young artist, singer, dancer, painter, actor, 
uh, director, uh, it, you need to come to New York City. You need to get your feet wet in New York City. You need to get involved with the arts in New York City. It's the mecca of the arts, as far as I'm concerned, it's my opinion, for this country. You know what yeah. I mean? There are great cities where the arts are terrific, but boots on the ground, get your feet wet, get down into the, into the trenches for young actors, come to New York. Come to New York, get involved with the music schools, the acting schools, the directing schools, the uh, scenic direct uh, uh, painter schools, the choreographers, all of that, the fashion, come here and, 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 and really, you know, grit your teeth and, and, and get involved and learn and study. There's so many great teachers, there's so many places to go work, you know, and, and to learn from these amazing people. You know, this is the place, if you're a young artist, come, come to New York City yeah. and get your feet wet. No, I, I love it. And that's why I love living in Connecticut because all I do is take the train to Grand Central. And I go, just recently I saw American Buffalo that had um, Lawrence Fishburne and Sam Rockwell. Such yes. Great. Play. I saw a great play. I yes. saw a great play. The entire cast was amazing. Do yes. you know what I mean? The, 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 the director was amazing. And uh, I just, I was sitting there going, hey, uh, Lawrence, I wish I could have been in your role. Because Lawrence and I have done a, a, a wonderful movie together. He, he's wonderful, man. We had a lot of fun together. It was Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, uh, what's, it, what's this guy? You know, forgive me for being so slow. No. Uh, <laughs> my son, Jamie, Jamie Gass. She's a wonderful actress. And uh, what's the guy from uh, 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 Apollo 13? Oh, Tom Hanks? No. No. Kevin no. Bacon? Kevin Bacon. Uh, Kevin Bacon. Forgive me for, you know, I've done so much that I, I can't sometimes remember all the names, but Kevin Bacon. Yeah. It was one of his first films. And a uh, matter of fact, it's inter interesting because, you know, he was a bartender in a little pub I used to go to all the time in, in the Upper West Side before he got his big breaks. And we said, you know, I used to joke with him and talk, you know, we, you know, all that. You know, actors were, you know, yeah, 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 and and blah, blah, blah. And he went out to Cali. I went out to Cali. And we got this movie called Quicksilver, which yeah. is Kevin Bacon, Lawrence Fishburne, Ruby, uh, uh, Rudy Diaz, uh, myself, the late, great uh, Louis Anderson. Yes. Uh, and myself. And we had a wonderful time doing that. And Kevin is just an amazing actor, a great talent. And a wonderful human being and a good friend. Well, you know, like he has a house. I'm not sure about it anymore, but he lived in Connecticut. He had a house in Connecticut. And one of my employees used to be friends with him because they lived not too far. And they said, I'm not going to be around for Thanksgiving. Why don't you and your family come over to the house, enjoy yourself? They said he was so welcoming, so friendly. And they said exactly what you said. And it's funny because they had a game years ago called The Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon because he has done so much that somehow everybody is linked to Kevin Bacon by six, at least by six degrees, because the guy has done everything, has been everywhere. And I'm so glad to hear people like that are such great people too. There's no ego involved down there. None at all. And yeah. his wife is a terrific woman, Cedric, a yeah. Kara Cedric. I mean, you know, they're just an amazing couple and, and non-egotistic. He's yeah. never let the business go to his head. He's a humble man, yeah. a gentle man and a very talented man yeah. you know what's funny speaking of american buffalo what's his name is it tom waits who played fox that... yes right. yes I, I saw an interview with him one time and he was saying that he did american buffalo with al pacino and i said i would i could picture that so clearly oh al, yes yeah al pacino doing the sam rockwell part and i'm sure he did the part of the guy from glee i can't remember what his name yes. was yeah but yes. yeah i didn't realize until recently i know david mamet wrote it and I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of his work, but I did not realize how old American Buffalo was made. It was 1975 it was written, but I mean, sure. said, yeah. So yeah, you've had such an amazing career. Speaking of plays, I want to talk about one in particular right now. The year was 1977. 
the play was called Secret Service. Tell me about that. <laughs> oh, man, I tell you, I was so nervous and so scared. Here I am up there with the one, the great, the amazing Merle Street. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you, I, 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 I mean, I found myself on stage with Merle Street. What did she won? 15 Academy Awards or whatever least, it is. I don't remember, you know. It's and at least the, that. In the, the, the great John Lithgow. I mean, I was on stage with giants, giants. Hey, I'm the little guy. <laughs> I was so scared and so nervous that I got cast in it. And I go, <laughs> Oh my God! You know <laughs> I'm here with Meryl Street and Charlotte, <laughs> but they took me under th their wing, and I've got the poster from the shirt from the play. And Meryl wrote a beautiful thing on the poster to me, very private but very beautiful. Yeah. And John did also, and I treasure it. And I will leave it to my daughter, my grandchildren, my great great grandchildren. And look, your your, your father was blessed and lucky enough to to grace the stage with giants yeah you know that, that i mean was your second year of acting too i mean you yes. started in 76 so you started off with a bang working with yes i did i was very 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 blessed to have to gotten out so many people auditioned for that role they saw a lot of people but i guess the director and the producers saw something in me he said you know my agent called me back david you got the role you know, you're in rehearsal with Merle and John and all these people. I was like, I remember going out with my friends and jumping up and down and running up the streets of New York, just yelling and screaming, going, hey, I'm going to be working with Merle Street. And, you know, she had not won a bunch of awards yet, but yeah. I knew this woman was destined to, to, to just be a super, 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 super amazing actress exactly. in John. And I, I just knew it. You can tell by certain artists that they got, you know, this person, she or he is going to be, go through the roof, beyond the clouds, beyond the stars, and just, there it is. And you know what I love? Um, she has a house in Connecticut as well. And I know people that have met her and they said, once again, I'm so happy to hear this, one of the most welcoming, nicest people in the world. Somebody said she walked into a grocery store with her kids. She picked up her kids. Oh my God, you're so cute. And talked to the her child for probably about 10 minutes. Talked to the mother for a while. And other people said the same thing. So I love hearing stories like that. That means she, like you said, a minimum of 15 Academy Awards. And she's another one that's just so down nerve, so humble and extremely talented. So you've, uh, you've got a great, great resume of working with people. Another one I want to talk about is streamers. Oh yeah. <laughs> what a great play. What a, what a, what a, what a great play. I saw it down at the public theater, Joe Pass public theater in New York city. Great play, great place for young actors to work. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, Joe Papp is no longer with us, but he paved the way for all these amazing young writers, playwrights and directors and actors to work, the New York City Public Theater. Okay, it still it still exists, great place to work. And uh, that's why I saw the play for the first time. And then I, I wasn't in that company, but I got a lot of offers to you know, take it on the road and, 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 and do all that, and I did. And what an amazing role to play that character I played. I mean, if you know the play, <laughs> you know the character I played. <laughs> Uh, it's just that I scared the hell out of a lot of audiences. I mean, I mean, people were coming backstage saying, you know, I hated you. I wanted to kill you. I wanted, I wanted to, and I go, but I'm just an actor. <laughs> you know, they go, well, we know that, but this character was such a villain. You know, the <laughs> villains, you know, I'm, I always want to play the villains because they're, the, they're like David Patrick Kelly and the Warriors. Luther, you know, Luther. the villains are always the most interesting characters. Yeah. You know, it's not the, the cute, pretty, pretty guy or pretty. It's the villains that have so much meat and so much death and so much. Oh, my goodness. You, the person you love to hate. <laughs> but you can't take your eye off. <laughs> and my character in, in that role, in that role of streamers, that guy, that that person. And I think 
I brought it to the T. I came with my A, my A game with that one. See what yeah. I mean? Like I said, every night people were coming backstage saying, hey, man, uh, I mean, I had Vietnam vet guys coming back saying, because, you know, streamers just, you know, these guys, these guys about Vietnam, you know, and blah, 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 blah. You know, and I'm like, I said, yeah, man, but, you know, don't choke me, okay? <laughs> so remember, I'm an actor, okay? But yeah, man, I just wanted to frag you. I don't know if you know what fragging is. A lot of, a lot of, uh, the, a lot of the soldiers in Vietnam, they fragged a lot of these wannabe uh, second Louis that just got out of West Point. It's a true story. I'm not telling anything that's not true. But a lot of these uh, Louis were putting their guys in danger. See you know what I mean? And so they, a lot of fragging happened. You know what I mean? This is true. This is true. You can look it up and you can go through the archives about what happened to a lot of these second lieutenants that were just thought they knew it all. And you had these guys who went doing you know, one and two, three tours in the NAM. You know what I mean? Saying, you don't know it all. Let me teach you. Shut your mouth up. I don't care what those bars you're wearing on your shoulders. Shut up. You know, you ain't been here. You just got over here because you got some bars. You're going to try and tell me how to deal with these the, the platoon or these soldiers in the boonies out there in the jungle, you know nothing. Shut up and listen to me. I'm quite sure you saw the movie Platoon. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and there it is. It's all about that. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I wish I would have done the role on Broadway. I didn't, but I did, it, I did get a chance to do the role around the country. And I had a great time doing it. And what tells an actor that knows that you know you did your job when people come back and go, man, I want to wring your neck. <laughs> That's the best. That, that is definitely the best compliment. And I can think of a play, a Broadway play that I saw where something similar happened. There's a play about Carol King called Beautiful. Yes. And the yes. First, the, right. The first half is all about her and her husband writing hits for all these other bands. And he was a real jerk. Yes. And it was funny because at the end of the play, he came out and I was looking at people. When he came out, people were hesitating to clap. And then they realized, oh, he's just acting. And they started giving him a standing ovation. But everybody in the room, the time I saw it, hated him so much, they actually hesitated clapping when he came out on stage. And they're like, oh, wait a minute. That's not really the guy who was married to Carol King. That's how realistic it was. So I, I love personally... Larry, I think his name is Larry Drake. He played in the show Law and Order. No, L.A. Yes. Law. Sorry, L.A. Law. L.A. Law, he was, yes. He was saying one of the biggest compliments he ever got was, oh, you're not you're not um, challenged? <laughs> People thought he was, like, mentally retarded. He goes, oh, you're not? And he goes, that's the biggest compliment I can get because I did my I did my job. I made people think that that was really me. So when you're that much in the character and audiences either hate you that much or really believe that you are who they see on, on the screen, that's a huge compliment. Absolutely, because I remember uh, coming out backstage and there were people lining up to get the autographs from, from the actors. And when I walked out, they were like, boo, they were like, boy, you, you, you bastard, you, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I go, and I would just go, hey, guys, I'm just an actor. And then they lighten up and then they start clapping. Said, yeah. Man, you did one hell of a performance to make me hate you like that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give one last example of that because I was recently I was watching an interview with Norman Lear and they were talking about the Jeffersons. And yes. there's an episode, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, where a KKK guy has a heart attack. George gives him mouth to mouth. I and saw it. I yes. said, I would rather have died than have you give me mouth to mouth. Norman Lear said they had to get that white actor out the back door because the audience hated him so much they actually wanted to kill him. They were waiting outside to kill him. They had to, he kept on trying to tell people exactly what you said. He's an actor playing a role. He's not really a racist. He didn't really mean that. And they just did not. I think the actor was James Karen who played Poltergeist. Yes. Yes. Yep. So it's, yeah, no, yeah. it is. It's amazing, you know, when an actor or an actress does their job. And you really do the character, no matter how good he or she or he is, or how horrible she or he, he is. When you do your job as an artist and you make that audience believe that this person, that they go, my goodness, 
you know, my goodness, my goodness. That is the biggest compliment to yes. any actress or actor that could that you could get. Not the Emmy Award and the Tony Awards and the Oscar and on and on and on and on. That's when you go home and you have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, or a glass of wine, you go, you know what, Lord, thank you. I did my job today. I yeah. did my job tonight. And again, this is so early in your career. So you must have started off, obviously you did. You started off with a bang, working with great people. People hated you so much in the very beginning that you were doing your job. But it was during that play, this is why I brought that play up, is where somebody said, hey, there's a movie named The Warriors. You should audition for that. Yeah. A matter of fact, it's funny because I was out doing streamers. Yeah. I was out doing streamers in Minneapolis. Okay. I get back to New York City. The show closed. We had a great run. A matter of fact, they wanted to extend it, but I, I wanted to come back home. I, you know, I was like, you know, I'm tired of living in hotels and all this. I, I want to go home. Yeah. And I told my agents, I'm going to come home. And I said, you know, just come replace me. You know what I mean? And uh, so I, I came home. And uh, my agent says, you know, David, uh, uh, Paramount Pictures are in town and they're casting this movie called The Warriors. And they got the whole cast, but they haven't got this character. Walter Hill is looking for this character of Cochise. And he's seen all these actors. He's not not fond on anybody you've seen. He, he's still looking. He's trying to find Cochise. We're going to send you up for it. Now, remember, this is a time before cell phones and we, we, we went up the time of pagers, okay? No, no cell. There was some, but those big walkie-talkie things. <laughs> yeah. okay, remember, remember that? that it was, like as, okay? it was as big as this. There we go. That's what That was a cell phone, okay? <laughs> and so uh, I said, yeah, yeah, sure. And they said, well, we're going to send you up. You know, you, you go up to Paramount, which was on uh, now, which is... Trump Tower. Oh, I don't want to mention what, what's on 59th Street. <laughs> yeah, so I, I want to send you up. So you go up, you're going to meet Walter Hill and Lawrence Gordon, the director and the producers. Producer, I said, yeah, sure, what I got to lose. You know, so, you know, I had two scenes, prepare two scenes, go up to meet Walter and, and Lawrence Gordon, the producer, and I go up to Paramount. And Matt, now the whole cast is, are, they're all, everybody's cast already, except Coach East. Mm -hmm. So I go up there and I walk and I go, I'm going, damn, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I walk in the room and this sitting Walter and he's so cool. He's so cool. <laughs> he's like, so cool. And Lawrence and Lawrence has done, went on to mega, mega movies, you know, billion dollar movies. Lawrence Gordon. And, uh, and so I walked in and I had the first scene to prepare for Walt and Lawrence. And I, you know, and, and there's a reader that you read with. And uh, and I start the scene and I get halfway through the scene and Walter, ha he has always has like this toothpick in his mouth and he, you know, and he's really looking at me and he goes, okay. And I didn't get through half the scene. He goes, all right. Then he looked at me and he said, uh, go down a wardrobe. I didn't know what that meant. I ran out, I said, well, okay, okay. And I'm, Walked out and I went down and I said, let me go down to the, I went down across the street to a phone booth. Because remember, there were no cell phones. Yeah. So I called my agent up and I said, hey, you know, the director told me to go down to Walter. What does that mean? You know, this is my first feature feature. And I go, and he goes, you're smuck. You got the role. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I love it. I walked back in the building, went down to Walter. And there were all the guys. Here's Michael Beck and James Remar and Terrence and but the whole cast, all the Warriors and Dorsey and then Terry and and, and uh, I, I go in and I, I I go up and I said, listen, I'm here for wardrobe. And she goes, I meet Bobby Mannix who did the the costume, which is a brilliant brilliant costume, you know, designer. She goes, try this put on this and I said well and I said you know I have some ideas about the guy she goes okay give me your idea yeah yeah so we we get the costume together and I go out and I meet the warriors right in another room and they all look at me and I'm looking at them and I go okay <laughs> and I said uh guys I'm Cochise and they went welcome to the party right. welcome welcome to the party welcome to the group you know and they shook my hands and 
we gelled from that moment on. We became the cast, the nine warriors. We became the cast. And that's how tell, just watching the movie, you could tell that you guys had such a great time and you got along well. I mean, oh, I we did. It shines through the screen. You could just see that the, the chemistry between all the actors, and I love it. Yeah, we 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 just like to this day, yes, 40 something years later. I mean, I am the godfather to Michael Beck's Beck's children. He's the godfather to my daughter. Wow. I mean, that's I mean, you know. I mean, how close can you get? We, we talk <laughs> to each other close. all the time. You know, we do conventions. We talk to each other all the time. We, we don't see each other every day. I mean, half the guys live on the West Coast. Half the guys live on the East Coast. You know what I mean? But we talk to each other all the time. And uh, we love each other. We see each other at Comic Cons, you know, and we enjoy each other's companies. We go out for dinner and we have a, you know, it's like 40 years never passed. Yeah. It's like never passed. Like it just never passed. It's like we still feel like we're back in our trailers back in 1978 when we were shooting. You know, we feel like we're back in the trailer 40 something years ago. Okay, what are we going to shoot tonight? And blah, blah, blah. What are you going to have for dinner? And what's the catering made? And is the food any good? <laughs> you know what I mean? That kind Actually, of stuff. That's funny that you bring that up because I want to talk about that. There was one time that you and some of the other people, I think the uh, Turnbull ACs were another gang that got sick of the catering. Oh, yeah. And you decided to go to dinner somewhere else with your color on. What happened next? What, what happened is that, you know, we got tired of the catering food. So we said, I'm going to go to a fast food place. So uh, we walked into a fast food place and we ordered, you know, I don't know if it was whatever. It was a fast food place. So we get, I don't want, I can't name names. So we, we went in there. And we sit down, we're eating our food, but apparently the Turnbull ACs had the same thing. They didn't want to eat what the caterer had. So they walked in and we didn't have our colors on, actually. We did. We had on our regular shirts and blah, blah, blah. But the Turnbull ACs walked in with their colors on. They met these all bald headed guys, mean looking dudes. And they walked in and everybody in the restaurant got up and walked out. <laughs> you know? Because they thought it was some real gang. They just got up and walked out. <laughs> and we were laughing our behinds off. We, we, we just took it as a big joke. It was so funny. Because if you look at those guys, those are some mean-looking dudes. As, as Terry Michaels Vermeer said, those are some desperate dudes. <laughs> you look well, at them. I have to say, in the movie, besides that one scene in the, with the orphans where you said, why the hell are we running? That's really the only gang you ran, ran from. Nobody else you were even afraid of. But that was the, besides, well, all right, there's a couple scenes with the Lizzie shooting you, but the Turnbull ACs, that was the one gang you're like, yeah, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah, <laughs> even, even badass Ajax says, yeah, right. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we were not going to fight these guys. There was no way, there was like 30 of them on a bus. There's only nine of us. Well, eight of us, because Cleon, remember, he got a nice thing to shove up his butt. Cleon yeah. is gone by that yeah. time. He's, he's gone by the, the concrete scene. See, he's killed off by the wrist. So it's only the eight of us. You know what I mean? And uh, we were not going to fight those guys. There was no way the Warriors could have won that. You know what I mean? Okay. The baseball furies is, you know, we they, they won that fight. You know, yeah. uh, 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 Cochise, Vermin, and, 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 and Rembrandt, well, you know, Lizzie's didn't have much of a chance, even though they had guns and they couldn't shoot for shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking but, the same thing too when I saw that movie. It's like, how can they not hit anything? They didn't hit anything, you know, which was very <laughs> actually very funny. You know what I mean? But uh, we were not going to confront the Turnbull uh, uh, Terminal ACs. Uh, the orphans, we just laughed at them. Yeah. As Fox said, they're so down low on the list that nobody even counts them. <laughs> well, you say I I mentioned off the air that, and it's going to be airing soon. I interviewed Apache Ramos, who played uh, Orphan Number Two. Yes, uh, he's the one that says we're going to rain on you, Warriors. Yes, <laughs> such a great guy, and he had so many interesting stories. So, if people, the Claws Corner fans of that, you have to watch. It's coming out soon. But speaking of that scene, I want to talk about that because. Okay. That was the one scene where you said, yeah, I think we need some, uh, we need, not, it wasn't called hazard pay, but you needed some pay, extra pay. Because oh, yeah. Injured. Yeah. Oh, Let's talk yeah. About that. 
Okay, well, the whole thing is when, uh, you know, when yeah. Apache says, we're going to rain on you, Warriors, and uh, uh, what's his name? The late uh, actor, he passed away. He was, um, says, uh, Gregory, is it, Gre is it Grecos or? Gre Paul yeah, Paul Greco. Paul, Paul Greco. Greco. He says, uh, you see, Warriors, you see what you get when you mess with the offense? And then and Patchy goes, yeah, we're going to rain on you, Warriors. And then Michael Beck Swan lights the Molotov cocktail. Yes. And he throws it right at the car and then car lights up and then we run okay now the tech guy put i think a little too much explosive in the car all right so we're running past the car the clear clear uh clear it called it's called clear camera well the hood blew up and it blew up on top it went so high it blew up on the roof it landed on top of the roof you know it's a third story roof and it blew up there but it was just so powerful that it just knocked us off our feet. You know, it was so, and so we got hazard pay. You know what I mean? We got stunt pay because that was, was not supposed to happen. So the studio gave us hazard pay because of that. You know what I mean? That was like basically stunt pay because, I mean, it was just too powerful. And so they compensated us and gave us stunt pay for that. And we were, you know, we were, we were okay with that. Yeah, well, Patchy actually said too. He he was trying to be in the scene, so he got as close to the car as he could. And I guess they forgot to take out the windshield. Yeah, the windshield blew out. I mean, I mean, the camera guys were all behind plexiglass, so they could nothing could happen to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. They had all this tarf and plexiglass glass around the cameras and the camera crew and all that, but the actors were exposed to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, were exposed to the explosion. You know, it was so powerful. It blew the hood off the car onto a the roof of a three-story building. That's how powerful. And the windows blew out, and he was just... But, you know, thank God no one got seriously hurt. I mean, I hurt my ankle pretty bad because I, I, when I fell, I twisted it. But uh, the one that really, throughout the entire film, that really got a lot of damage was Deborah Von Volkenberg, Mercy, our, our warriorette. Yes. Well, let's talk about that because we, uh, as, as I mentioned um, in the other interview, and I know you mentioned plenty of interviews I've watched you on, the come out to play was improvised um, with the bottles. Also, Apache said, we're going to rain you words was improvised. Tell me where the line, hey, where'd you get that jacket? I stole it. They're, gonna, they're looking for a woman in a pink blouse. Why was that line added to the movie? Okay, okay. When you see... Uh... Michael and Deborah running down the stairs. Deborah trips and fall and breaks her arm. Mm -hmm. Okay, she breaks her arm. So what do you do? Okay, you, you got she can't. You know they took her to the hospital that night. They put a cast on her arm. All right, they brought it back. And the next scene, uh, when Mike meets her, they get separated. Mike meets her when he tells her, "Get up, you bad luck, get lost." Blah 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 blah. And he sees her again when she goes, hey, there's some guys looking for you. These guys are watching. She goes, I know they're watching me. I know they're on my ass. But now they know Now they know I know it. And yeah. he goes, where'd you get that coat from? She goes, well, the cops are looking for a chick in a blue top. So I stole it. Well, she had the, that had to be written in because she broke her arm. So they can't show a cast on her arm. Yeah. So they give her a blue coat to put on to cover the cast. Because she fell and broke her arm. So the studio, the writers had to cover that up. And that's how they covered it up. You know what I mean? I love it. I'm with the show. Just keep going. Keep going. And then there's another time. Let's talk about this. She also got hit in the head with a bat. She got hit in the head with a bat. And uh, they had to stitch her up. <laughs> that, was, that was the scene, obviously, with Michael Beck, I'm guessing. Yes, that's the scene with Michael Beck. Okay. You know, and... So, you know, she got more injuries than anybody else. <laughs> one tough chick. That's all I have to say. That's and she was one tough chick. Well, that movie I can take is, care of my own. <laughs> that movie is filled with so many iconic lines. And most of the lines we talked about were improvised, like um, come out to play. And we're well, David Patrick Kelly, I'll tell you how he did that. Yeah. Uh, in this neighborhood, there was some guy. Where he lived that always say, Hey David. And he'll he'll tell you about this. Yeah. Hey David. Every time he go into the guy would just go, Hey David. Hi. 
and David, and David never forgot that, right? I wouldn't and either. So, and so when David got on the set, that line uh, come out to play. He improvised the bottles. He, he snuck the bottles into the hearse. Walter didn't know about it. We know nothing about it. And David just said, Will you come out and play? And his voice kept going up and up, up. And rrr, rrr. first you hear, rrr, 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 rrr. and then you see the bottles come in the frame. And then you hear David, come out and play. This, we're talking about a brilliant actor, a method actor, a brilliant, brilliant actor in an incredible, warm, special, humble human being. But in a May, he played John Lennon. Yes. He played John, and he played him beautiful. He's a singer. He's a writer. He's a performer. He's, he's a multifaceted human being artist and just a down to earth wonderful man. I cry when I think about David Patrick Kelly. What yeah, a was, great man. Yeah. Well, I'm so great glad artist. he didn't get typecast because, I mean, I know he played in 48 Hours not too long after that, but I'm so glad that he was able to play roles like John Lennon and then also play the heavy in other movies because yeah. that is, that's a great actor. And I'm so glad that Walter Hill didn't say, stop it and go, what the hell is he doing? Because after hearing this, thinking of your reaction, the Warriors reaction, and I didn't realize at the time when I was watching it that that was you hearing it for the first time too. You, you didn't even know he was going to do that. So you're going, what the hell? Look at this? the reaction. Look at our reactions. Yeah. Walter yeah. just said, he don't know. What, and after he did the closest with David, then he went to the war and he had two cameras rolling. One yeah. on the oh, Warriors yeah. and one on David. You know what I mean? And he, our reaction was like, what the shit? What? <laughs> what the? We knew he was the, the bad guys were following us, but then when he did that, and we heard the, drrr, 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 it, I mean, it made your skin crawl. It made your skin crawl, and we just saw, you know, and, and he, he uh, we we fed off it, and it worked. Yeah. And, and when Walter popped each one of us through reaction, so that it you, you see it, you oh. know what I mean? It was just brilliant. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Walter Hill was brilliant. Walter said, okay, I got this. I got this. You know, we didn't know this was coming, you know? Yeah. Walter didn't know this was coming. Just, yeah, he talked about method acting and, and improvising and just being creative. There it is. Yeah, I love it. And it, you could definitely see the, that it's a genuine reaction when I'm watching the movie after I know that story. Another line I want to talk to you about, see if it was improvised or if maybe it was planned was Roger Hill doing, can you dig okay, it? Okay, let me tell you, Roger Hill is a Shakespearean, was a Shakespearean actor. Yeah, I can okay. tell. Okay. Uh, you know, classic, classically trained. And if you look at what he did, he was doing Macbeth, Hamlet. He was doing a little piece of turf. <laughs> that's, that's crap, suckers. Because it's all... He was doing Hamlet. He yes. was doing Macbeth. You know what I mean? In the way Walter shot, shot him climbing up the, the pedestal and going on and his hand movements and his, his face and everything. Because it's all. This guy was preaching. He was a preacher. He was Macbeth. He was Hamlet. He was Shakespeare. And his diction, his, his mannerisms, he created that. He made all the gangs fall in love with him and go, you're right, Cyrus. You know, yeah. you're suckers. Can you dig it, <laughs> suckers? Can you? I mean, he pulled every, he pulled us in, except Ajax. You look at Ajax, oh, yeah. he's going, who the F is this guy? Yeah. This is bullshit. You <laughs> <laughs> know what But he had us going. He had all the other warriors going. Even you see a smile on Swan's face. Yes. Face always very stoic, very stoic. You know what I mean? Very, very stoic. You even saw a kind of okay. 
maybe this guy's got some point to himself about. Yeah, no, very charismatic. But, you know, you see all the rest of us yeah, going, yeah, 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 yeah. Except Ajax. Ajax looking at the rest of us, you bunch of ass, you know, you bunch of, what are you, fools? <laughs> you know, he didn't buy into it. You know? Ajax but, always wanted to be war chief. He always thought everybody was a wimp. So he wasn't falling for any of it. No. Yeah. But the question I have for you, was any of that improv or was that all scripted? That was scripted. That okay. was scripted. But, but Roger brought life to those lines and made it more than what I thought the writers ever thought could be brought to that. Oh, definitely. You know, he gave it a life to it to his own. He brought it to a level that I don't even think the writers ever thought. You know what I mean? Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. They, they uh, I mean, you know, that they, they just, you know. Well, what's amazing about that too, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was that you heard he was a last minute replacement for that role. Yes, he was. They had somebody else and something happened and they uh, brought Roger in. And thank God they brought Roger Hill in because he just made it, just memorized. He made it immortal. He made it, he brought, he brought that scene to levels that I, I thought was his brand. Yeah. You know, just absolutely brand. Yeah. You know, I mean, to this day, I walk down the street, Rick, and, you know, and people say to me, can you dig it? You know, if you can count, sucker. <laughs> you know I mean? There are iconic lines in the Warriors. Oh, my God. You yes. know, I can't, you know, you know I mean, there are lines that people still say today. Yeah. I can't, I walk down the street and say, if you can count, sucker. Or the biggest line is, can you dig it? You know I mean? Yeah. I get it all the time. All, all of us get it all the time. Well, the, best the lines thing, are kind of, iconic. Yeah. I saw a midnight showing it. So they have a lot of it now in Connecticut. They show it every so often. The place was packed. Everybody's quoting every line. Everybody's having a great time screaming at the screen, you know, laughing at all the right parts, screaming at all the right parts. They knew all the lines. Yeah. It's so much fun watching that movie. And surprisingly, I want to talk about this because the movie was released in theaters February 9th, 1979. It was number two at the box office for three weeks until lawsuits and gang violence began happening. And then all promotions in the film was pulled from wide release, which was a shame because, I mean, really, I don't think it's the movie's fault that this happened. But for me, and I'm, I was 11 years old when the movie came out. So I, I remember seeing it when HBO and the movie channel came out. And that's when I think more people started seeing it again and became, started a little bit of a resurgence because originally in the theaters, it got pulled too quickly. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, Paramount got nervous. You know what I mean? I guess I don't know what they're worried about, but I don't know, whatever. But they pulled it. Do you know what I mean? I mean, certain cities, uh, they were saying gang violence and fights are happening in the theaters and they were blaming it on the Warriors. and They just yanked it. And it's a shame because yeah. for three weeks it was, it was a blockbuster hit and the studio was making a lot of money. You have to understand this movie was made for very little money. Do you know what I mean? It was no big budget film, do you know what I mean? Uh, you know, for what they made it for and what they got back in return and what they're getting back in return nowadays for 40 years later, do you know what I mean? I'll tell you an interesting story, you know? I got a movie, and this is the course when everybody's doing all these Vietnam movies, you know, Parker's Now, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, and I got one, a little one, uh, didn't really go anywhere. It was called Purple Hearts. It was starring Cheryl Ladd and Ken Wall. Ken Wall was hot. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And David, and David, yeah, and David Harris. And here we are in the Philippines. Let me tell you something, Rick. I got off the plane and I'm in the airport and people are staring at me. Couldn't take their eyes off me. They're not staring at Cheryl Ladd and Ken Wall. We're on the same flight. And I'm like, why are these people staring at me like this? You know? And all of a sudden, people started saying, it's the Warriors. The guy from the Warriors. The guy from the Warriors. And I go, what? And so some guy came to me. Man, do you realize that your movie every night is playing at downtown Manila? It's two, two features. The Warriors and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes. Every night, downtown Manila. I had such a fan base. I'm telling you, I'm shooting... 
I had security of the Yang Yang <laughs> in the hotels all over the place, more than Ken Wong and Joe. It was all about me because I was a superstar over there because of the Warriors. Yeah. Every young person was trying to meet me and get a hold of me, and the girls were going nuts. You know what I mean? That, oh, it's called Jesus in the Philippines. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was, just, it was nuts. Yeah. And I had a great time. I mean, I was feeding off it. And I'm trying to shoot this movie. <laughs> and the Philippine uh, police were all over the place trying to keep the crowds back. And, you know, and, and I would just go, look, look, I want to meet the fans. And Come on. You know what I mean? And yeah. I was signing a million autographs, taking a million pictures. And, you know, there were girls just saying, I, I, I just want to marry you and have your baby. Wow. You know, I just want to. I just want to, you know, please just let me marry you and let me have your baby. That, you know, all is, I mean, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of girls, gorgeous, beautiful women. Just, I just want to marry you. That's all. I just want to marry. I just want to have your baby. Wow. <laughs> you know? I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. But because of the Warriors, it was a smash hit. You know, in in in, in Asia, it was a smash hit. You know, smash hit. Well, as they say, the Warriors are good. Damn good. No, real good. Real the good. Best. The best. And when, when, Swan, when Swan says, the best. You yes. Warriors are good. Real good. Yeah. And Swan goes, the best. Yes. <laughs> that, obviously, in the Philippines, you are. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah. Oh, big time. Big time. Big. Oh, and I was there for three months shooting this movie called Purple Hearts. You know, another Vietnam War story. Yeah, I've done so many movies. And, and you know I mean? But everybody's, you know, it's all about either the Warriors or Soldier Story. Yep. Yeah. Well, you've done so much, and we're going to talk about that in a little while, but I still want to continue with the Warriors because mm -hmm. so many great things about that movie. So the novel Soul Europe, he wrote that. What was it? Yes, he did. Yes, what, he did. What was it based on? It was based on this Greek army back in uh, BC uh, that was trapped behind enemy lines. Uh, and they had to fight their way back behind enemy lines back to their lines. Mm -hmm. So that's how Saul Yorick based the Warriors on. Okay. This mythical story is about this Greek army that was caught, caught behind these uh, in, 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 um, or, uh, where in the Middle East, wherever it was based on. Uh, I believe it was based in Iraq or Iran. And uh, this Greek army, they, were, they, they, they had to fight their way back from behind enemy lines back to their own lines. And that's how Saul Yuri based the Warriors. Well, you mentioned you filmed it for four months, but that's uh, a little bit longer. Had, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say this, Rick. Well, that's where I was going with this. Go we, ahead. We, yeah, we had a basically a nine-week shoot schedule, right? Nine weeks. Well, we went five and a half months, okay? And it's because there are four different versions of the Warriors. We don't start off at, at, at night. We start off in the day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We go to all these different neighborhoods. But Walter kept shooting and shooting and shooting on the stuff. You know what they call the suits at the net, at the studios? The suits and powers to be? Yeah. You know I mean? that, that, that call the shots. We call them the suits. You know what I mean? They kept liking all Walter's dailies. So they kept sending money and kept saying, shoot uh, on, shoot on. It, you know, they're like, wow, this is just stuff this brand. You know what I mean? So nine weeks turns into four, five and a half months. Wow. Well, I'm so glad that we have YouTube because because of YouTube, I was able to see most, if not all, deleted scenes. And I know what you're talking about. In the opening scene, they actually have Sidney Poitier's daughter. Her name is yes. Pamela. Pamela, Pamela talking Poitier. to Cleon. She played Cleon's girlfriend. Yes. And that's not in the movie. No. And that's not in the movie. You know, originally, uh, Swan gets caught by the the, uh, the Ducky Boys, which are, are a gay gang. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> that ain't in the movie. Uh, we, we we go to Chinatown, and we have to fight the Tongs. You know what I mean? These karate guys. That's not in the movie. It's a bunch of stuff that was shot that yeah. hit the cutting room floor, as we say, that's in the vaults yeah. of Paramount Pictures. All that stuff is in a vault of Paramount Pictures. They own all that. They have all that. 
yeah. all the, the there's a few stuff scenes like you just mentioned you can see on YouTube the scene between uh uh Darcy Wright Cleon and Pam Portier his girlfriend yes you know in the, the scene where he's talking to us on a boardwalk we're going and blah 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 and Ajax Kojak you know heavy muscle and you know on and on and on you know what I mean Rembrandt you got the stuff Mark, Mark, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Assigning us who's going to do what. Uh, Swan, second in command. You know what I mean? War Chief, second in command. You know what I mean? And on and on and on. And then all these scenes that we shoot in the daytime, you know what I mean? That's never in a movie. Yeah. You know, it's just never in a movie. Yeah. I mean, probably because I only know the edited version. I love that version. And, but I'm so glad now with the advent of, First, it was VHS, beta VHS, DVD, now streaming, and YouTube. You can see what they had, and maybe they'll put it on a DVD, all the deleted scenes. So we're able to see what hap- what was cut out. But I love the fact that with the movie was so streamlined, and it was right to the point. Starts off going to the meeting, because I know there's a scene, maybe you just talked about it, where they're looking for the meeting, and they're like, where the hell is this place? We don't know where it is. I saw that scene, too, where they're, uh, you're looking for the meeting, then they look up and there's everybody in the conclave right right absolutely yeah well let's talk about that because as you just mentioned it went way over budget so i guess there was a time where the uh, studio said whoa what the hell's going on and the assistant director was fired yeah he uh he was fired uh i you know i'm sorry he was a nice guy but uh i think the studio he wasn't up to par and they brought in a AD from California that was very, very sharp. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, on his piece, he was, you know, AD from California. He worked on a lot of films and uh, and they, they brought him in and he started getting the, the gears in on on the right track and, and saying, look, you know, this has to be shot. You know, we can't do, you know, we can't go over, but we can't go over budget. We can't, we, you know, we have to stick to blah, blah, blah. What ADs do, they whisper in the director's ear like look you know you know we don't have another you know twenty two thousand dollars a shoot so you, you gotta you gotta get it you gotta get it done now you know what i mean you we can't come back tomorrow night at this location you know what i mean to shoot it all over again you know get it done and that's what ad's do and they, they they're on top of the crew you know make sure you have your cameras where they're supposed to be you know the actors are in place the actors are ready the lighting is ready. You know, we can't stop for four hours for the, the DP to relight everything. You know what I mean? That costs, everything costs money. Yeah. Everything, when you make a movie, everything, it costs money. Every second you do, there's a dollar sign ringing. You know what I mean? So a great AD comes and goes, listen, I got to watch the dollar signs. I got to watch the money. I got to watch Look, we can't afford another forty-three thousand dollars because the lighting is not quite right. So we got to come back and do it all over again. Do you know what I mean? That's another four. And because the suits back at Paramount are going, you just cost us another forty-three dollars, forty-three thousand dollars. Wow. You know, you're there to watch our backs. You know, you're there to whisper in the director's ear, the DP's ear the actor's ear, the crew's ear, and everybody else, look, it has to go boom, 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 boom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Are we ready? Everything set? Cameras ready? Actors set? Go. You know what I mean? And that's what ADs do. Good ADs do. You know, And that's what happened. Oh. So the first guy got fired, and they brought in some guy from California that said, hey, I'm not here to play games. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, part of the money of the budget went to the location manager because they had to pay the gangs off. Oh, yeah. Listen, that's what they, they I mean, that's what location managers do. They come in there with a lot of money because, uh, listen, we, we got kicked out of areas. Okay. Yeah. We got kicked out of uh, areas where uh, the, the local gang said, hey, hey, it, it, you know, hey, this ain't happening. You know what I mean? You know, unless you blah, 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 boom, 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 bum, bum, bum. So here comes a location manager with a wad full of money going to the local gang guy. Hey, man, look, hey, you know, let me grease your palm. <laughs> and, and let's, let us do this scene here, okay? Don't, don't throw us out. You know what I mean? So they come in there with a bag full of money and they grease the right palms 
and so you're able to shoot. Yeah. You mean I mean it's, you know, listen, man, it's business. It's don't take it personal. It's business. Remember the Godfather? Oh yeah. Don't take it personal. It's business. You yeah. know what I mean? You know that's one of the classic lines from the Godfather. Which don't take this very personal. true. Yep. It's business. Yep. You know what I mean? I think there was you only know? one time, and it was in Spanish Harlem, when the gang said, "No, you got to leave." And, and believe me, we <laughs> packed up and we left. They said, "They say that <laughs> we had to pack up all the trucks, all the set, pack everything back in the, the trucks in the set, and we had to go and find another location." That happened, but see, that cost us the studio money. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? But they weren't having it. They said, "No, he ain't shooting here." You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's no way we could have got around it because they would have they would have done shit that would you know stuff that would have no we yeah. we couldn't have been able to shoot. Well, another thing too is I guess the Hell's Angels had a problem with the uh, Warriors' wing of Death Skull. Yes, it was their logo. They had it patent or whatever you call it, and uh, so negotiations came again. The uh, the uh, manager, you know, uh, yeah. had to de deal with the angels and make it right that we were able to have that on our vest and all that. And we got their blessing, I guess, or whatever you know yeah. what I mean. We're able to go on with that. And uh, a few of the angels were hired as our bodyguards and worked on the film, yep. personal security. And uh, we moved on. I think you there's know, one but, in particular. His name was Mike the Bike. He was an extra. Mike the Bike. The Mike the Bike who had his thumb caught, cut off when he's repairing his bike or something like that. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He 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 was part of the movie uh, from the first third all the way to the end. You know, wow. he he was he was on set and he he had a job. <laughs> Mike the Bike. He had a job. You know, but he was the reason why we were able. I I guess were able to use that logo and, 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 and without a problem from the angels. What was the percentage in the conclave scene of actors versus real gangs? Uh, Sylvia Fay, who was the extra casting, actually went into a lot of the hoods, South Bronx, East Harlem, Harlem, uh, Low East Side. And it was her and her team that went and hired local uh, youth organizations saying, look, we're going to shoot this movie. We, we, we need people for the conclave scene and we're willing to pay. They got X amount of dollars in a box lunch. You know what I mean? To, to, to come there. I think we it took us like five, four or five nights to shoot that scene, the conclave scene. And the way they kept on coming back is they had raffles for color TVs and, and all <laughs> kinds of stuff to keep these guys coming back. I love you know it. what I mean? Each night. And they would come back because, you know, the color TV back in those days was a big deal, you know, or boombox and, you know, other incentives to keep these kids to come back. And they got, I don't know what they got paid each night. And they got a box lunch. You know what I mean? An apple sandwich and a soda <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a piece of pie or something, you know, and raffle tickets. And whoever won, they would get this big color TV or a big boombox or, you know, this kind of stuff. And yeah. so these young kids, they came back, but we had a lot of real gang members in that scene. You know what I mean? We had a lot of real gang members, but you know, they had a lot of ADs and second ADs and third ADs that would kind of smooth them over and say, look, you know, man, we need you guys to really cooperate. And you know, when the director says this, you got to go this way. Cause you know, it was chaos when everybody, when Cyrus gets shot, everybody's running and you know, blah, blah. And then, and then the cops come and it gets chaotic. You know what I mean? And when Cleon gets killed, when Luther says, the Warriors did it, the Warriors did it, you know, and they, they kill Cleon. But they 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 had it orchestrated. They had, uh, you know, a bunch of, like I said, second and third and fourth ADs in the crowd, keeping people cool and tell them, hey, what you got to do is this, blah, blah, blah. And remember that color TV, remember that boom box, remember this, you know, this uh, $300, that ticket that can win $300 in cash tonight. You know, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, they kept them happy. That's good. Yeah, kept them happy and kept them coming. There was one gang in particular that wasn't happy. Let's talk about Homicide Incorporated. 
Yeah, yeah. When we first got there, we were shooting on the boardwalk, right? What happened is that the art uh, department went there before we shot that scene in the daytime on the boardwalk. They wouldn't paint, paint over Homicide Incorporated and put the Warriors up on there, oh. right? So that didn't make the Homicide Incorporated gang very happy. They said, how, how, you guys got some, you people, what? You know, what? So again, here comes where the money comes in. You yeah. know what I mean? Where you grease a palm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They had to deal with the leader of the Homicide Incorporated. And they, hey, look, man, look, uh, we, you know, it's a film. And when, once we're finished, we will erase this and paint back Homicide Incorporated. I love it. You know what I mean? And, and they, it was negotiations again. You grease the palm. Money talks and bullshit walks. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And, you know, don't take it personal. It's business. You know what I mean? You know, and so that's how the studio got away with that. You know what I mean? Because they came came up to us, the real dude saying, who are you you punks? You know? Who are those punks? (laughs) Who are you? Bunch of Hollywood. What? You know, we're the real deal, man. That word homicide, what do you think that means? (laughs) <laughs> you know, you know, we're not called, you know, the Warriors. We're called Homicide Incorporated. Okay, you know, you know what that means. You mean what? What that means and what we will do. <laughs> so again, the guys with the money comes in, and you grease the palm. You chill things out. You calm things down. You know what I mean? Yep. And that's how I went. Well, I love this story. It was, I guess, that you. You, Dorsey, and a couple other people were in the trailer, and you heard the knock on the door. Who's who's head of the Warriors? Who's head of the Warriors? And oh yeah, oh Leon, yeah. Leon pointed to the art department, and said those guys down there. <laughs> yep, yep. And it, it, you know, I mean, it was amazing because I wasn't going out on the trail. I was like, hey man, I'm an actor. I'm not here to to uh, negotiate with the real deal guys. You know what I mean? Oh, definitely. There's no way. You know what I mean? Because those guys meant business. They were not playing around. You know what I mean? Yeah. There was one neighborhood that we went in at night and uh, the gang members came out and said, okay, you guys are okay, but get the colors off. You know, when you're not filming, no colors. You don't walk around this neighborhood. You don't do anything. When you're not shooting, take the colors off and put regular shirts on. And we did. We, we respected their wishes. You know, we did, we did not. You know, once we were not shooting, for like lunch or dinner, or whatever, those vests went off and came on regular shirts. They said, just take them off, you know, for lunch and dinner. When you're shooting, you got our permission because we know you're shooting, you're making the movie. But once you stop shooting, get rid of the vest, take them off. You don't, you don't wear them in our neighborhood. And it's almost like the orphans go as civilians, right? I have to come down on you. Right. Bait, you got it, Rick. There it is. You know what I mean? Take off, remember, take off your colors. Yep. And Swan goes, we don't do that. You didn't <laughs> If you don't, we got to come down on you. He yep. goes, we don't do that. We, we you know what I mean? <laughs> you know? But wow. basically, that's what the real gangs are saying. Take wow. them off. Take them off. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, you, you went through a lot to make this movie. Speaking of gangs, did you ever see the documentary called The Rubble Kings? Yes, I did. And I spoke with the person that did that. Did that. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, um, for people who don't know, it's a documentary about gangs and it's very similar to the Warriors. It's a real life gang system. And they said, you know what? It was basically like a Cyrus said, we got to get along, get along. We have to get together. And somebody actually got killed trying to go out there and preach that. And his mother said, you're all about peace. That's what my son was for. Honor. So then R&B is what brought them all together. Music. They started forming bands. They started having parties. Yeah. And, yes. Uh, so it's a great documentary. It's called The Rebel Kings. I saw it on YouTube and I highly recommend it. Yes. Yes, I do too. Now, in 2005, there was definitely a resurgence in the Warriors due to the video game being released. Yes, 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 Rick. Rockstar, which is a really wonderful company, uh, you know, Grand Theft Auto, they, they've done some great video, video games. And uh, they did The Warriors. And they brought us in to actually do the voices. You know what I mean? Not everyone, because uh, 
I mean, they had some problems with Roger and David. I think they sued because they were using their voices without permission or whatever. That's a whole other thing. But uh, yeah. But basically, you know, uh, you know, I did my voice, and and the other guys they did their voices. But there were a few actors that did, didn't didn't want to do, you know, go and record their voices for the uh, video game. But the video game, I'm very proud of. I think it's a great game. I don't know if you ever played it or looked at it or played yeah, it. Yeah, I have. I you know. It. It, it's a wonderful game. I happen to think that my character is the best character in the game. You know, you got to go through all the levels, but I think that, that they did a great job with Cochise. Yeah. I'm very pr- I'm proud of it. And uh, I love the game and uh, kids uh, are loving the game. It's amazing. Uh, you know, every Halloween on all these college campuses and, you know, all, not only in this country, all around the world, people dress, dress up especially as a baseball furies, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, that's a, that's a whole cult as it is. The baseball furies, the warriors, the orphans, the Turnbull AC, the Lizzie's, the hi-hats, people dress up as these gangs on Halloween. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Uh, uh, there's a show called Chilla, which you were at, yeah. and so many people come dressed up as the warriors, and especially the baseball, because they're the most... Uh, Oh, I mean, Walter's vision of that game was just amazing. I love that I game. I mean, yeah. if, I don't know if you ever saw a movie called Clockwork Orange. Love that movie. No, okay. No, okay. I met him too. Okay, great actor, great, great, wonderful actor, but that whole costume stuff, what they did. The troops. There, the troops, you know what I mean? Yep. Uh, and Walter's vision of, of, of the baseball furies. No one has ever done anything like that. Do you know what I mean? With the the makeup and the the Yankee outfits and the baseball bats, and that fight in the in the park, I mean that's nothing but the Seven Samurais. Yeah, look at it's nothing but the Seven Samurais. Instead of swords, you got baseball bats. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and and, and, and Ajax classical. I'll I'll take that bat <laughs> and shove it up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. Classic line. Classic. <laughs> Another I mean, one. There's so many classic lines in that movie. Classic line. I mean, but but the whole thing when when they come out the dugout, yeah, and the warriors see them. What I mean, it's mem- mesmerizing when you look at that, and they're swinging the bat and they're coming out the dugout. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And the warriors see them, and then uh, Swan goes, "Maybe you ought to take off." And then <laughs> Ajax goes, "Yeah, right." <laughs> you know? I mean, Walter's vision of that at night. And that makeup and that the you know I mean, uh, how brilliant can you get? Oh, yeah. How brilliant can you get? You know, and that's all Walter. I remember back in the set, late seventies, early eighties, when I used to watch it on HBO and Movie Channel. That was the one scene I could not wait for when I was 11, 12 years old. I was like, there they are, my favorite guy, the baseball. I love that scene. And it's just like, yeah, like you said, it's just the, his his vision of it and. I never even put together the two things that you just said. One, the Seven Samurais, and two, Clockwork Orange. But now, being much older and seeing the movie so many different times in a different light, I definitely see what you're talking about. And I love Walter's vision of that. It's such a, as the whole movie has, it's such a memorable scene. But that, the the look, the feel, the, it's great. It's, I mean, it's just classic. It's just so classic. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. I felt like a wimp when we shot the Lizzie scene buying that. I, you know, <laughs> I felt like a wimp. <laughs> you know what, though? I think a bunch of wimps. Ajax is a bunch of wimps. <laughs> and then I felt like a wimp. You're getting tired. Uh, you know what, though? But if I were you, though, I'd be going with the Lizzie's myself. It's like, eh, you know what? You guys take off. I'll be with these uh, women over here. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? A little, a little break in the action, remember? Oh, yeah. A little break in the action. <laughs> Coaches knew, knew what it was all about. Yeah, you know what I mean? Take it easy, man. We're running, fighting all night. Are you kidding me? These beautiful girls? Hey, come on, you nuts. You know, poor Rembrandt. Hey, maybe, guys, we got to be getting out of here. You know I mean? like, come <laughs> on. Chill out. Chill yeah. out, man. A little break in the action, man. These pretty pretty girls. We're going to do something here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that scene, I mean, it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole film, the, the fight with the baseball furies. Yeah. I mean, it's just so classic, iconic, and the way Walter shot it and the way uh, Andy Laszlo, God rest his soul, the DP who lit it was just brilliant. You know, just brilliant. The whole thing, Walter created that whole thing, wetting down the streets 
put that whole sheen on the street. Walter yeah. did all, created all that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, Andy Laszlo, the DP who lit the movie, created all that. The way uh -huh. all the stuff in the park, how the park was lit with the baseball series. I mean, Andy was just brain. He did uh, Shogun. Okay. He lit Shogun. He lit Shogun. Okay. If you look at Shogun, how brilliant that is, and how, the look of that, that was Andy Laszlo. Ah, that, you know what? I didn't know he did that, but I could definitely see that it's the same type of work, so the same artist. Yes, yeah, you can see it. You can see it yep. in Shogun. Yep. You go back and look at Shogun, which was a brilliant mini miniseries with Richard Chamberlain, whom I worked with at the Public Theater, me and Tom McKitterick who I did a play with Richard at the Richard Chamberlain at the public. I mean, I get this stuff that's just not even on my IMDB, you know, uh, you know, so much stuff is just not even there. You know, well, that I, 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 you know what? I want to go one more question about the Warriors, but I want to get into that because off the air, you mentioned something and I was really intrigued. I did not know this. So before we talk about that, I want to talk about Tony Scott and the reboot of the Warriors. Yes. Well, as we know, Tony lost his life. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, un unfortunately, he was a you know, brain director, Wrigley Scott's bro uh, brother. But he was he was going to do a remake of The Warriors. But the only thing that he didn't want any of the original Warriors because we were too old. You know, uh -huh. he was going to reboot it. And, uh, and uh, I think it was going to be shot in L.A. I kind of, my personal opinion is like, how do you shoot The Warriors in L.A.? I mean, it's an iconic New York City exactly. setting back in the 70s. How do you create that in Los Angeles? Yeah. You know, there's no subways in Los Angeles. There's no no look of the city. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, you can maybe go to San Francisco, Francisco somewhere, but New York is New York. You can't create recreate New York. You can't recreate the streets of New York. You can't recreate the subway system. That's how, yeah. you know? I mean, the subway system doesn't look the way it is anymore because all the great graffiti artists are gone. All the great graffiti in the city is gone. Yeah. The subways are Snow White. 42nd Street is Times Square. Uh, uh, Times Square, 42nd Street is Disneyland. Yeah. Shooting. Back in the day with all the prostitutes and pimps and, and uh, porno houses and drug dealers and everything else, that's all gone, man. That's all gone, you know? The city doesn't look like that anymore. Times Square is not like the subway system. There's no graffiti. There's nothing. You can't create that. That's all gone. No, no. You know what I mean? You can't perfect. create New York right. City. You can't create New York City in Los Angeles. I don't care what anybody says. You know what I mean? But I mean, I don't know what his version was going to be, but it didn't happen because he passed away. You know what I mean? And then it, it all died. And my personal opinion, you, you know the old saying, Rick, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. You know what I mean? You cannot create The Godfather over again. Mm -hmm. There are certain movies leave alone. A lot of remakes are terrible, are yeah. terrible. You know what I mean? This is I, an iconic film shot in, in a different time war. Do you know what I mean? And you yeah. leave it alone, leave it alone. You can't create these characters again. You can't create the look of them. You can't create that back what happened in nineteen in the seventies. Yeah. You know, you create. You can't create Studio Fifty Four anymore. You can't create. You know, disco. You can't create John Travolta doing. You know, you know. You can't create any of that no more. Mm -hmm. You know, Saturday Night Fever. You can. That's all gone, man. Yeah. You know, it's gone. You know, you can't create that anymore. You know, I love watching the movies of the 70s. I'll give you some examples. The Warriors, Taxi Driver, and After yes. Hours. Those three movies capture the look, the essence, the feel of 70s New York. I love those three movies. Those are three examples that I could think of. I'm sure there's plenty more, but yeah, you're right. If they made a movie now, it would be so desensitized. And now, unfortunately, it would be too woke, too politically correct. It's just, I don't know, I think that, Leave it alone. It's not broke. It's a classic, iconic movie. Just like that, Jaws. I, mean, I can think of so many other movies that just please don't even try to reboot or remake or reimagine. Just let the original sit there and be the classic that it is. Absolutely. And, and Rick, I totally and completely agree with you. As I always say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Leave it alone. 
yeah. you know, leave it alone. Just don't, don't, don't try to redo it. No matter how the good intentions and all of this and all of that, it just, no. You know what I mean? I mean, I can't see anyone trying to go behind Francis Ford Coppola and try to do a remake of The Godfather. That'd be no. stupid. You know what I mean? Yeah. That would be absolutely stupid. Or remake, try to remake Jaws. It'd be laughable. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, certainly, it would just be laughable. You know, we just, what do you, what do you, why? Why would you do this? You know, why would you? But anyway, you know, so be it. It's all about money. Unfortunately, with studios now, they could really care less. Actually, somebody made a great comment. They basically buy the name when they do these reboots. They didn't care less about the content. They just want people in the theater, make their money and get the hell out. They can really care. I mean, I'm sure there are people that care about the quality of the work. I'm talking about some of the studio heads. They're they're in it to make the money. And so the Warriors, oh, my God, that's a classic movie. People are going to see that name on the marquee and go check it out. Yeah, but then they're going to say, this sucks. And then they're going to say, well, who cares? Next week, there's going to be another movie coming in. So unfortunately, I think that some of these studio heads just go by the name and could care less what is actually yeah. on the screen. What they think will be profitable. What they yeah, think exactly. that, well, you know, we can we can sell this and we can commercialize it and yeah. we can hype it. And people, you know, back when the original people that saw the Warriors 40 years ago will come, will come back in the theater to see it. You know what I mean? Or this new crowd, the new generation, and they that's how they think. You know what I mean? You these the people that, that market movies and market marketing companies and all this sort of stuff and they put a lot of money into all this st- sort of stuff and think that, well, you know, we d- do it this way. We can probably make, you know, X amount of hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know. You know, yeah. it's I, all I, about the dollars, you know, as, as a movie, another class movie, Casino with yes. the hero and Joe Pesci, you know, when Joe Pesci, the dollars is always about the dollars. <laughs> you know, I mean, I love that. The dollars is always about the dollars. What is the old bosses back then? You know, it's about the dollars. Always about the dollars. <laughs> yeah. it's well, a class. I, when I heard Tony Scott's name attached to it, I'm a I was a huge fan of Tony Scott. I love The Last Boy Scout. I love Top Gun. I would think, but I just there's some things I don't care who the director is, who the producer is, don't touch it. So yeah, I'm I'm with you. But I was when I heard Tony Scott was attached. Maybe you were thinking about it. I said. You might be able to, but when you just what you just told me, there's no way putting it in LA in this new era. No, it's no. It, it's past no. it. Let the Warriors be. But you, I want to talk about this because well, Warriors is just one of many, many, many things you've done off the air. You mentioned two names I want to talk about. One is Mary Tyler Moore. The other one is Betty Davis. Yeah, uh, yeah. working with Mary was just. A brain. She was such a sweetheart, such a kind person, and uh, a lovable person. Super talented. I mean, I I grew up watching the Mary Tyler Moore show. Yeah. You know who can then the, the hat flies in the sky. I mean, yeah, come on, yeah. and Ted, and you know what I mean, and oh, yeah, Lou, Ted, like, and all those classic characters. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I grew up on that stuff. You, know what I mean? you and me both. And, and and then when I found out, my God, like, I got cast in Whose Life Is Anyway. I said, oh, wow, I'm going to work with Mary. I, I remember telling my mom, he goes, you're going to be working with Mary. Well, she's a big fan of Mary Tyler Moore. And my brothers and sisters and my friends said, what? I said, I'm going to be on Broadway with Mary Tyler Moore, guys. <laughs> wow. And everybody, when I was trying to get tickets for my family and friends, everybody wanted to come see the play. And uh, she had all these wonderful friends of ours from Hollywood that come, that came, flew into California to see her. And I met these, you know, Rock Hudson. I get all these, all these names and people I was just enchanted by. And uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience to work with Mary. She was very, uh, she taught me many things uh, about acting because I kept my mouth shut when I worked with Meryl and John, all these guys. I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to learn from these people. So I would just observe and saw what they were doing when they were acting. Do you know what I mean? And I said, don't ever forget this, David. See what, what she or he's doing. Don't ever forget this. You know what I mean? And I learned so many things. And then when I met uh, Betty Davis, I mean, I did, I just dropped. I mean, he, he, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, she was quite on in her age and 
she wasn't quite sharp. And I mean, she was, you know, I mean, she's very, she's an old lady. Yeah. You know, but uh, she was, she was very nice and she was very nice to me. And, you know, I said, you know, Miss Davis is such an honor, an honor to hold your hand and to say hi to you and speak with you. And I mean, you're a living legend. You're, you're part of something that can never be replaced. And she went, thank you. Thank you. I love and it. I said, yeah, I said, Miss Davis, can I give you a hug? Yes. Hug me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm holding on to this living legend. You know I mean? I mean, like, you know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I said, Ms. Davis, I, I watched so many of your films, you know, and uh, and, and I, I mean, I, I can't even name one that I like the most. I mean, you were so brilliant in everything you've done. Do you know what I mean? And everyone that was able, that were blessed to work with you was so blessed and so lucky. She goes, hi. Ah, I, I'm just an actress. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I That's love hearing so that story because there's, did you ever see the movie Burnt Offerings? Yes, yes, yes. With Karen Black and, uh, is it Oliver Reed? Yeah, Oliver Reed. So I think, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I met the, the son at Chiller and mm -hmm. you hear so many horror stories about the old days of Betty Davis. So I said, and he said, she was the best. I was 12 years old. She'd come into my hotel room, play checkers and chess with me. I loved her. And she, he said exactly the same thing you did. She was so down there, so friendly because maybe in her heyday, she had some you know diva issues, but she is a phenomenal actress. And I love, if not all, I love most of her movies. She plays the best bitch. <laughs> Talk about- Oh yeah. Oh, talk yeah. about hating a character. I love watching her in movies. I'm like, I hate her. And she's doing her job. She does it well. Yes. I mean, I one of our one of our movies that's one of my favorite, whatever happened to Baby Jane. Yes, I was gonna mm -hmm. mention that. Was so <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the the lady was just phenomenal. She was just phenomenal. I didn't know what she was like back in the when she started in the yeah. late 20s and 30s and 40s, and she went back. 70 generations, you know what exactly. I mean? Uh, but all I know, what I could see on film, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and what the characters, the diversity of characters that she played, do you know what I mean? And yes, she was a diva. No question, it, she invented that word. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, she was the best of the best. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I remember when I met Catherine Hepburn, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> wow. I mean, I was like, oh. I mean, we, I, I, I couldn't talk. <laughs> you know? And I never, I never got to meet, uh, I met Sidney Portier. Diaphragm again? Oh, yeah. 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 Ha! We caught one. They're supposed to be weird. Oh yeah, no. If you say so. I've always wanted to be in a movie. Waiting around for autumn. Waiting around for 